we're very happy to welcome one of our project leaders on stage in our studio with Trisha. Uh, and now it's uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe, the senior man manager of the AU GFCE project, and we're going to have a, a chat uh, in just, just a moment. Let me uh, uh, simply tell you that um, uh, right after this panel, we'll have an interesting uh, session on measuring impact, because we are often talking about impact, the impact that, that we can have at the Paris Peace Forum or that our projects can have. Well, sometimes it's pretty useful to measure impact, to track whether results are there or are not there. And uh, we'll have a, a, a very interesting slate of uh, project and speakers including the World Benchmarking Alliance, which has been uh, with us uh, for a few years now. It's a project that we followed and that has uh, really done a great job at at following at tracking the results that companies uh, 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 have on the SDGs. What, how, uh, how much good are they doing in terms of SDGs, in terms of uh, 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 reaching the, the uh, uh, development goals? We'll also have uh, Philippe Aim from uh, La Poste, uh, the chief executive of Share Action, uh, and uh, Ethan Ruen from the Harvard Business School. So that's a session that will follow uh, uh, immediately this, uh, this coming next that we're having now. But back here okay. to the studio, uh, yes. Trisha. So you said GFCE. What that means is the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. That's and right. here at the forum, we've spoken a lot about the need for uh, South and North parity. And when we say that, we've spoken about how there have been a lot of racist policies being implemented, racist restrictions towards the African continent, and how we directly need to engage with the continent to give them the agency they need directly uh, to address the crisis that we are at facing currently. So perhaps Perhaps if you want to tell the people uh, watching, what is it that you do exactly? Uh, because there is a lot of conversation happening around cyber right now, this need to govern cyberspace. Uh, we had the whistleblower from Facebook as a speaker yesterday of Facebook. So uh, could you tell us what you do? Yeah, thank you very much for having me here, and I'm really uh, pleased to see that. Um, the GFCE entirely, it's uh, an organization that is a non-governmental organization with membership based uh, for looking at cyber capacity. And the cyber capacity we're looking at is in a global view. Uh, we've been working in partnership with the African Union in this particular project. African Union has a number of other constituents. They've got member countries, they've got agencies, they've got uh, other co the commissions within the African Union. The GFC has non-governmental organizations, They've got uh, uh, governments as well. We've got uh, donor agencies, implementing agencies who are working with us. So the two sides came together to make sure that they can look at cyber capacity building in the continent. Mm -hmm. So as you rightly said, there are issues around capacity building in various countries that we have in the continent. And we've seen in general, many of the countries are probably at the initial stages of capacity building in cyber. Therefore, they need assistance in terms of technical assistance. But at the same time, they also need assistance when you look at issues to do with policy and regulation and how do they make sure that they can sustain this project. So one of the aims of the project is to, first of all, do an assessment to understand where each country is in terms of cyber. And then the second issue is sort of like what we call a sustainment strategy. So we are forming what we call the African Cyber Expert Community. This community comprises of members from each of the countries. These countries will They've nominated already three experts to work with us, somebody from the policy side, somebody from the SAT who understands issues to do with critical infrastructure protection, and then we have from non-governmental organization participants and also somebody from the business sector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these are the composition of members who are going to work with us from the beginning to the end of the project. And then the third issue, which is very important, is the issue around formulating what we call knowledge modules. These knowledge modules are probably what you'd call best practice or good practice, but they are accessible online. And then they have different components. They'll be addressing specific needs of challenges in cyber, opportunities in cyber, and other areas that we're looking at. So those are the three main objectives of this particular project. Very, very interesting. Uh, you know, when talking about digital issues, too often uh, it's a, a northern discussion. It's a northern discussion because uh, that's uh, where uh, the uh, technologies are the most uh, uh, advanced, uh, oftentimes, uh, which leaves aside the fact that 
at least half of the users of digital technologies are in the South. And so we've been striving at the Paris Peace Forum, uh, in particular with the uh, uh, Digital Bill of Rights uh, initiative to have these North-South discussion on the users of AI or here on cybersecurity. And my question would be, um, are the needs for cybersecurity uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Africa, since you're working with the AU, yes. uh, any different from the North? Are the specificities of the uh, attacks, of the modes of attacks, of the type of protection needed uh, that differentiate the South from the North? I think th there is some differentiations. Um, the Interpol just released recently a report showing some of the five top cyber mm -hmm. attacks in the continent. And we find something like ransomware, mm -hmm. issues to do with social engineering, things to do with other areas of attack, which are very, very common in this part of, this, of the South because of the knowledge that people have and the security that is provided. So you find, when you look at investment of cyber security, both in the North and the South, there's a big disparity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the North, there's a lot of investment Many of the countries in the North have invested heavily in cybersecurity, while in the South, there's less investment, which exposes the population quite a lot. Coming to your question, we find that the South requires capacity in the area of establishing awareness, for example, establishing issues to do with the, 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 so sort of like the long-term protection of the citizens. And then also we are finding a lot of need when it comes to formation of national, um, uh, what do you call, the, the, the computer um, emergency response teams. Mm -hmm. These are certs yep, yep. that are used to protect this country. So some of the South countries, like you might find a good number, do not have certs which are established. Mm -hmm. But in the North, they already have that established. So therefore, if you talk of just how we can communicate between the two parts, the North and the South, there is a need on the South in terms of the initial stages of cyber mm -hmm. enhancement and so forth, while in the South we have some established countries that have already established. But the knowledge flow should be to encourage both the South to invest and to partner with the, with the North in terms of encouraging them to be able to address the issues that have been addressed here, that have been identified. You know, I love that, uh, I mean, I may just have a little bit of bone of contention with you just now when you say that uh, the North has been a sort of leader in technological uh, advancements. I think it's a monopoly, but I love that you brought in the word investment because I think that's why the global North countries can kind of put themselves on a pedestal uh, without acknowledging that there hasn't been a steady flow of uh, investment and resources. So I just want to take onus of the fact yeah. that, you know, we are in Paris, sure. right? Uh, but uh, we are here with the somber setting of acknowledging that when we say mind the gaps, there are uh, certain sort of rechecks that need to be done. Sure. So given where we are, given the people that you've heard be here over the last two days, the need uh, and the, the genuine concern to address some of the changes, what would you like changed? What is the sort of conversational point that you think is not being had when it comes to cyber expertise? I think, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, just to point out, we are all in the same ecosystem. Therefore, we can benefit equally mm. by learning from each side. Mm -hmm. You talked about technology. If you, took, if you look at mobile use for money and mobile use in the South, it's quite expensive compared mm -hmm. to what you see in the North. Uh, in the North, we are more likely to use credit cards and debit cards to do our shopping, but in the South, they use mobile phones. phones. So if you look at the use yeah. of just mobile use and how they've taken it to the farthest that you can take it, it's quite expensive. What I would see here is we need to have what we call a symbiotic way of working, where we learn from the South and we also learn from the North. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the North might be advanced in specific areas, and there's no doubt about it when you talk of companies that are working in cyber, when you talk of experts that are working in cyber, but the understanding, and I, look, I use the word DNA very carefully here, countries have different DNAs. Therefore, it's important that the North understands what the South needs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then involves the South from the beginning so that we don't have a drop-down type of approach, but a bottom-up and a drop-down so that we meet in the center and we can be able to get the solutions done. So one thing that I would urge from this particular forum going forward is more exchange of ideas, such as this one, and this platform is very useful, bringing things to the forefront so that people can be aware of them, and being open and also transparent in the way we approach issues so that we don't force the South to take specific technologies because we want to support them in a specific way, but we allow the South to have an independence of choice, but carefully uh, looked at with the needs of what the South mm -hmm. requires. 
so those are some of the things that I wanted to say, yeah. One of the things that we've uh, developed at the Paris Peace Forum is these uh, these large scale initiatives where, where sure. the UN uh, where the UN cannot act because of great power tensions or mm. because of other other problems. We try to uh, uh, to to help, and one of the things is the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. Obviously, yeah. that we've celebrated because the uh, EU and the US decided to join uh, the Paris call on uh, on on Thursday, two days mm. ago. It was announced by Vice President Kamala Harris and uh, President of the European Commission uh, Ursula. Von der Leyen, um, uh, you know, obviously we've we've strived to expand the Paris call, uh, which is now more than 1,200 uh, members strong, uh, to the uh, south, to uh, to Brazil, to Africa, to pretty much uh, everywhere. What? How useful are these global norms uh, in your daily work? You work uh, on the ground trying to build awareness, trying to build that community of experts, trying to build a specific knowledge uh, and empower people to take uh, their own cybersecurity uh, in, in, in hands. How useful is, are these, uh, uh, let's say, normative uh, uh, frameworks that we are pushing uh, here? I think I want to echo the words that my colleague Chris Painter mentioned yesterday during the session that you had. And I think a collective approach to, normal, to norms might be useful in the sense that let's give countries a discussion. And the UN has been very useful in collating uh, views and ideas and suggestions from countries in terms of what would be the normal way of acting so that we can have all actors playing within a specific framework of the norms. So, for example, the use of technology or cyber to invade or to attack another country, mm -hmm. we should be able to inhabit that. We should also look at cyber as a, 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 a technology for good, not a technology for mm. adversaries and all that. So I think, for me, the way that we are going, with, especially with the UN and the, the resolutions that have been passed in terms of how we should go around it, I would support that because that actually has a collective view of the whole issues. And then we should be able to also allow some discussion in areas that are contentious. For example, where you have uh, equipment manufacturers or mm. software manufacturers mm. or the private sector mm. uh, piggybacking on specific policies that their countries of origin are embarking on in order to support specific countries. So I think that's something that we need to look at. And giving the recipient countries the opportunities to be able to choose mm. technology based on their requirements in an understanding that it is not necessarily going to infringe or it's not going to be a threat to the neighbors and any others. Mm. So I think that's my view on that one, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Honestly, we've had uh, the pleasure of interviewing many people, but I'm really struck uh, by just the broad expertise that you have brought on board and also just uh, the work that you are doing. Thank you so much. Perhaps we could ask Mart uh, Martin uh, uh, if, uh, you know, what, how he sees, uh, first of all, how you came to the Paris Peace Forum and uh, how did you, uh, uh, why did you uh, embark on that process? And second, after the Paris Peace Forum, what you see as, as yes. the further developments of this year and perhaps what you need also from uh, people around. Yeah, so let me just uh, talk to your customers as well. I think what I've seen, first of all, is the the, 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 the fact that we are leading this project and the fact that it was considered as one of the 80 sort of impactful projects in the world, we really take that with, uh, with, with very, we humbly, we humbly feel that that was very useful for us. And the fact that this project also has a projection of what the impacts will be, we really feel that that's very important. For us at the GFCE and the AU, and I know I'm representing quite a lot of my colleagues out there, and they'll be able to see this at some point, we are going to make sure that the results can see the light of day. Uh, and then going forward, what I've seen, and I've discussed with some of your colleagues already uh, in terms of what I think we should do, I think, look at it this way, maybe a regional peace forum might be useful so that we can capture a little bit of the issues, especially when you talk of the Pacific, when you talk of the other parts of the world, the Caribbean, when you talk of the African continent and others, they might have specific regional issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So therefore, thinking of the Paris Peace Forum in a regional type of distribution way might be a useful way, because then that one we can come and collate all the issues at the Paris, when you come to Paris, then we can collate all the issues after we've already discussed them at the regional level. And then going forward, I think for me, you've done very well in terms of the hybrid model. Mm, and I you. know COVID <laughs> was an issue. Um, and then, of course, we'll make sure that next time we come in and participate. And then, of course, make sure that the results of the project are able to be uh, talked to and, uh, of course, given to the other people next year. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank that you very was much. Uh, uh, our uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe uh, from the uh, AU uh, GFCE project, improving cybersecurity in Africa, and uh, I would say pumping up and and uh, uh, strengthening the the resources uh, for cybersecurity in Africa. So now we have the the session on uh, measuring uh, impact, and then soon to come afterwards several sessions, including on climate, culminating with the closing ceremony at 4:30 which will start by uh, with a discussion with John Kerry, the US uh, presidential envoy on climate, doing an assessment of COP26. How did it go? Where do we move from there? Where do we go from there? And a couple of others like Ben Ki-moon uh, or uh, the uh, Chinese Minister of Environment, uh, Mr. Rung Xiu. Uh, and so stay tuned and we hope to have you uh, until the closing ceremony at 4.30. Thank you again, Dr. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so again. much. Merci. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.